You're listening to the Exploration Films Podcast. Hey everyone, it's Steve Ryder, producer of the Exploration Films Podcast. Carl is currently getting settled in his new home in the Orlando area, and we wanted to play for you this audio special that was created for the Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution series. These films have been the most popular films that we've produced, and so we wanted to bring this to you. So, enjoy this Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution audio special. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And on the fifth day, God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Nice story, but uh, what about evolution? I mean, I definitely believe that evolution happened. You can't say that things didn't evolve. I mean, animals have evolved to be where they are today. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Evolution is proved in the theory of fossils. Yeah, there's no way you can say that evolution didn't happen. Really? I mean, how can you say? I don't know that I wasn't an ape when I started out. You think that God just went poom and put, like, everything there? No, they evolved. Uh Uh-huh. So tell me, what do you believe about this theory of evolution? Well, first there was nothing, you know. Then there was the Big Bang. Then stars and solar systems mysteriously appeared. And then, one day, billions of years ago, a bunch of stuff got thrown together in this swamp-like soup stuff, and it accidentally created a living thing. From there, everything evolved and crawled out of the swamp. And here we are! Of course, it took millions and millions of years. (laughs) So you believe that no one plus nothing equals everything? Uh, yeah, I guess. It's science, isn't it? Mm, That's debatable. Stay right where you are for the next half hour or so. You'll meet some amazing animals that evolution just can't explain. What animals? You'll learn about a bug that shoots explosives at its enemies. Really? Discover the secret of how geckos can walk on ceilings. And hear about a small land bird that doesn't swim, but when it migrates, it flies nonstop over 4,000 miles of ocean. That's incredible. Welcome to the audio special, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. I'm Steve Swen. In the next little bit, you will be amazed as we hear about some of the animals you can actually see in the Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution video series featuring Dr. Job Martin. Now, we'll tell you more in just a few minutes. First, let's introduce you to the man who will be our guide as we discover these amazing critters that confound the evolutionists. Here's Jim Beldheis to interview Dr. Job Martin. We're discussing today a fascinating video series called Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Our guest is Dr. Job Martin. Dr. Martin was a traditional evolutionist, but his medical and scientific training would go through an evolution, rather a revolution, when he began to study animals that challenged the scientific assumptions of his education. His findings are documented in the video series, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. And for the past 20 years, Dr. Martin has been fascinating his students as he lectures around the country on remarkable animals that cannot possibly be explained by traditional evolution. Dr. Martin, thanks for sitting down and uh, talking with us today. Thanks for having me here. So what was your background and your training? It's pretty extensive, I know. Well, I began my college career as a music and biology major and got out of Bucknell University as an evolution and then went to the University of Pittsburgh, College of Dentistry, became a dentist. I was agnostic, looking into Zen Buddhism, and I was an evolutionist through and through. So in your scientific training, you were trained as a traditional evolutionist. Now, what were you taught, and how did you begin to change your thinking? I went off to college and took a course in comparative anatomy, which basically convinced me that evolution must be true because you had your little hands that looked the same as birds' wings and different things like that, and bones that looked the same, and so so I became a very convinced evolutionist. You mentioned a Buddhist, but how did you go from there to becoming a Christian? Well, after I got out of dental college, this was height of the Vietnam War, I was going to go in the Air Force, scheduled to be one of the dentists for President Johnson's flight crews, Air Force One, presidential fleet. I had to go to basic training first and uh, decided just to say a prayer, and I did. I'm sitting in the officer's club, and I decided to say a prayer to the God of the Bible, and I just asked him to either show me the girl I was going to marry or he was going to see the wildest Air Force officer he ever saw. And he answered that prayer. That's the day I met my wife. 
So I decided the God of the Bible must exist. So that's how I moved into Christianity and then got a job on the faculty at Baylor Dental College as a professor and gave my first lecture on the evolution of the tooth. And that's when I began to move from being an evolutionist to being a creationist because I was challenged by two of my students to study creation science, 1971. So tell us, those students, how did they challenge you? What did they do that made you really think twice about this whole thing? Well, I gave this lecture on how fish scales gradually migrated into the mouth and became teeth and, and the whole evolutionary idea there of teeth that I was taught. So they just came up after class and they said, Dr. Martin, have you ever investigated the claims of creation science, which I had never heard of? So they asked me to study it with them and we found two books in 71. There's lots of books now. We read those books, started studying the assumptions that the evolutionists make that I was never taught and students are not taught today. And then we started studying animals. So basically that was the progression. Dr. Martin, uh, tell me about the bombardier beetle. That's an interesting creature that I saw in the video. Actually, that was the first little creature that we studied together, these two dental students and myself. This little bug, about a half inch long, has the ability to aim and shoot at 360 degrees. It's like a gun turret. And so it has two nozzles, one on each side. For instance, if a spider is coming up fast on one side, it doesn't have to turn around and shoot out its hindquarter there. It can just take its little gun turret and bring its nozzle up and just shoot right out its side. By the way, it's an interesting explosion. It is a pulsating sequential explosion. All you hear with the naked ear is just a pop, but the explosion itself is like a if it wasn't sequential it would be almost like lighting an afterburner on a jet engine and this little bug would just shoot itself right out of the picture with this sequential explosion it can hang on with its little feet and doesn't blow itself out of the picture it can shoot its enemies so it's just a marvelous creation that really it does defy evolution in the first video we see full screen slow motion footage that shows in fantastic detail the bombardier beetle in action shooting his built-in cannons at a large spider Dr. Martin, you have a funny line in the video. You say, dead bugs don't evolve. What specifically about the bombardier beetle makes it a creature that totally confounds evolutionists? The problem with that little bug is it mixes chemicals that have this violent reaction that would destroy the bug if it didn't have all the equipment it needed to survive. It needed to have like an asbestos line firing chamber. It needed to have uh, at least somewhere for it to go. It has twin tail tubes. And unless it has all its parts, there's no way it could evolve just a little bit at a time. And that, that got me thinking. We're talking with Dr. Job Martin about the video series Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. We'll be back after this. Isn't that bombardier beetle just amazing? You know, David Hames, the on-camera host of the Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution video series, had his own encounter with a bombardier beetle. David, what's it been like to chase around these animals and be a part of this series? Well, it's been a lot of fun. We've got to travel to different places, see some interesting animals. For me, I've definitely learned a lot. Uh, I've always had a fascination with science when I was a kid. I uh, wanted to be a marine biologist for the longest time. So this is, this is you know, right up my alley and you just kind of learn all sorts of different things. Well, have you had any encounters that you'd like to tell us about with any of these animals, any behind-the-scenes stories or anything? Uh, other than with the creatures at the zoo, not so much, although I take that back. When I was a kid, I did encounter a bombardier beetle. It was the strangest thing. I grew up in Tennessee, and one had managed to find its way into my jeans, <laughs> and it burned me, and for a split second, I thought, what is this, a cigarette, a lit cigarette? I mean, it was like on fire. Whoa. When I saw what it was, I saw it was this little beetle and did some investigation and came to find out that it was a bombardier beetle. Wow. I remember seeing one other one when I was little and that was when I was fishing and saw one on a rowboat and recognized it and got it to do its bombardier thing and, you know, a little puff of smoke came out. Pretty darn amazing. I mean, it literally shoots a small fireball at you getting stung or burned or whatever you want to call it, uh, I still have a uh, scar on my leg to this day. And I was probably 12 years old when that happened. So uh, yeah, pretty incredible creature. <laughs> you just don't want one in your pants. Yeah. Trust me on that one. <laughs> well, thanks, Dave. <laughs> we appreciate your insights. Well, let's get back to the interview with Dr. Job Martin. Here's Jim Veldheis. Welcome back. I'm Jim Veldheis, back with Dr. Job Martin, talking about the video series, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. One of the amazing creatures featured in the first video is the gecko lizard, famous for their ability to walk on walls and ceilings without falling. 
For years, that little creature has baffled us as we wonder, how do they do it? Well, new technology has allowed scientists to discover the amazing answer to that question. With details of their findings, let's listen to a clip from the video, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution, Volume 1, featuring Dr. Joe Martin. Down in southwest United States of America, we have different kinds of lizards, and a couple of those are very interesting. One of them, called the gecko lizard, has some very special characteristics. Its feet. Now, if you have a little pet gecko lizard, and they're friendly little things, you can watch that. It'll run right across your ceiling. You could have a ceiling made of glass, and it'll just run right across the ceiling. It doesn't fall off. Gravity does not pull it off. And, and so the scientists, for many years, they just didn't know what makes that lizard be able to stick like it does. So they took its feet, which are a special kind of feet, and, and they magnified the feet. And they discovered on these feet, there are like little hairs, little tufts of hairs. And so they thought, well, that's not enough. And that was with 2,000 magnifications. And they said, well, that's not enough. Uh, there's something else here. So they put it under phase electron microscope, these little hairs, and they kept magnifying them and magnifying them. They got up to 35,000 magnifications, and all of a sudden, there was the answer. All over these little hairs are tiny little suction cups, but you have to magnify them 35,000 times just to see the, the suction cup. Now, these suction cups are so powerful that if the foot was not made in a special way, when that gecko let's say, put his foot up against the ceiling, it would just suck it right up against there, and he's stuck. He's not moving. So his foot had to be made in such a way that he can use other parts of his foot to pop loose those suction cups. So what he'll do is, and if you look at the foot of a gecko, it, it looks different than a, a normal lizard. Most lizards have kind of finger-like with big nails on them, and the gecko, though, has like these little rounded uh, pads on its foot, and it can take those feet, and they're almost kind of rounded on the bottom, so that it can, for instance, use the suction cups in the front to pop up the ones in the back. Or it can use them on the side to pop up the other side. And so it just does it naturally, but that's what's going on. How would a lizard evolve little 35,000 times it takes to see the magnifications? How would it evolve that? And why would it evolve that? And why would it have the right kind of a foot that has to be there if it's going to have those suction cups? All of that had to be there all at once. What it shows is God's incredible creation, even to the finest little detail. It's incredible. Well, the tallest animal in the world, we went from one of the smallest to the tallest. It's the giraffe. It's a beautiful animal as well, but it is incredible. Why is that so? Well, I think if you look at a bull giraffe, about 18 feet tall, they have a powerful pump which is their heart to pump the blood up into their brain against gravity when they're standing there with that long skinny neck. And then they have a little problem. They, they bend their head down to get a drink of water. And now that big powerful pump, and on some bull giraffes, it could be up to two and a half feet long. It gives a mighty squeeze and shoots that blood. But now if his head is down getting a drink of water, the blood will be going with gravity instead of against gravity. And it's enough to blow his brains out, but it doesn't blow his brains out. So you have to say, well, why not? Well, he has like five valves built into the artery in his neck and they close but the last pump is beyond the last valve and it's enough to burst the little arterioles but it doesn't go into his brain the last pump goes zoom underneath his brain into like a sponge and gently expands that so that he doesn't blow his brains up and so he gets his drink of water now he's going to jump up fast to let's say run away from a lion well he jumps up runs five steps passes out now he doesn't have enough oxygen to his brain what happens there? Well, as he begins to come up, the little valves in the artery open, the sponge under the brain gently squeezes that blood up into his brain, the veins that go down the neck, they close, and so he has equal blood pressure, good oxygenated blood, no matter what he's doing, and that had to all be there at the very same time. You can't slowly evolve that kind of thing. So he has these parts that he needs, and he needs them all there, and he needs them all at once. So it's not an evolution thing, it's it's God creating exactly what he needed at the very beginning. I think it defies evolution. You, you can't have little parts evolving one at a time, little bit at a time. Well, Dr. Martin, it does seem that evolution is taught as fact everywhere you go, whether you're in school or a zoo or a museum, watching it on television. Surely scientists all agree on that theory. Isn't that right? Evolutionary scientists do. There are a lot of scientists who are creationist scientists that have degrees from the same university as the evolutionary scientists, but these scientists would say, we believe in God, and therefore we're going to put on a different set of glasses. 
scientist to look at the information. So it comes down to kind of a worldview idea. So we have the same evidence. They have the same fossils we do, same living creatures, same planet, but we just look at it through two different sets of glasses. Same information, different interpretation of that information. Here in the studio, you're being very gracious, Dr. Martin. But in just a moment, we'll play a segment directly from the second video where you point out specific examples of evolutionists' intellectual dishonesty. This could be the most compelling few minutes our audience will ever hear confronting evolution as so-called science. Listen to Dr. Job Martin talk about intellectual dishonesty from the video series Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution, Volume 2. The whole idea that ideas have consequences Look at our culture. Look, look at what's taught in our schools, our universities. Uh, we even have things that are taught that aren't even true, and they're known to be not true. There are things like uh, Heckel's embryo pictures that are still in current textbooks. And there's all these little embryo pictures of horse and cow and pig and, and human, and they all look exactly alike. Well, that was proven to be a fraud back in about 1884, and it's still in the textbooks. And then you have things like the peppered moth. Well, what's going on here? You've got these peppered moths that are growing on these tree, living on these tree trunks. And during the Industrial Revolution, apparently the tree trunks got covered with dust. And now all of a sudden the birds can't see these light colored ones. They just kind of blend in, but they're eating all the dark colored ones. And that just proves natural selection. Well, the fact is that whole thing was a fraud. Those, those, those moths don't even grow on tree trunks. They don't land on tree trunks. They live up in the top of the trees. And so the birds can't be eating them off the tree trunks when they don't even land on tree trunks. And so those pictures are still in the textbooks. Okay, by the way, that was exposed in 1999 publicly. And so we have a, a system of delusion that is propagated out there that most people don't know and they don't even know. But there's some people that do know and they just keep doing it. When we have people like Carl Sagan that go on television and they'll say, Evolution is no longer a theory. It is a proven fact. That is baloney. And he knew that. But that's called propaganda. When, when a distinguished man with a PhD degree and a white lab coat gets him up in front of the average Joe six-pack and says, we have proven evolution is true with our science. Well, first of all, he's not talking science because you can't prove macro evolution with science. It is more a philosophy. The fact is, evolution is not a proven fact. Hey everyone, Steve Ryder here. If this sounds like something you'd want to watch with your kids or grandkids, or present at, say, your homeschool group or Christian school, be sure to go to explorationfilms.com to purchase. And if you want to check them out before you buy, you can rent or stream them just about anywhere, like Apple, Roku, Amazon Prime, and more. Our topic today is creation versus evolution, and our guest is Dr. Joe Martin. We're looking at some remarkable animals found in the new video series, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Well, Dr. Martin, if evolutionists uh, agree that matter is all there is, then they have to somehow explain some of these animals, like the woodpecker, for instance. Yes, uh, most of us have heard uh, the common woodpecker out there, back there on the tree in the backyard. Does it have any special features? Well, it certainly does. It has a certain kind of a beak that's harder than other birds' beaks, so it can pound into trees that'll bend nails. It has a special shock absorber between the beak and the skull. It has special kind of feet, special kind of tail feathers, different than other birds, many, many differences, all specialized just so it's a woodpecker. I mean, if some bird decided, I'm out of food, I gotta find food, and I think I'll become a woodpecker. So he climbs up on a tree, and how would evolution explain that? But that's apparently what happened. They tell us the birds are running out of food, and so we gotta do something different to get their lunch here. Well, some bird climbs up on a tree, and he's not a woodpecker. What's gonna happen? Well, if he rams his head into the tree, he'll shatter his beak, who knows what. But the woodpecker doesn't, because he's made to be a woodpecker. His tongue is unique, I think, in the animal kingdom. One of the woodpeckers, the European green woodpecker, his tongue starts in his throat goes down his throat, comes out the back of his head, under the skin, comes up over the top of his head, comes out a little hole between his eyes, into the right nostril, then out through his mouth. Well, I've, I've said to evolutionists, could you please explain to me just one thing? Where does that tongue come from? Well, they can't do it. They don't have an explanation. Well, their explanation is, well, just give it enough time and it'll happen. That doesn't explain it. In the video, you have striking evidence of that tongue. It twists and turns through a long, circuitous route, but it works perfectly by design. 
I'm talking with Dr. Joe Martin about his video series, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Dr. Martin, in the second video, you show another bird that doesn't look unusual, but it has some unbelievable skills and characteristics. Tell us what makes the golden plover so unusual. I think God has made very, very special birds, and it's fun to watch them. The golden plover is a little bird, not a very big bird, about the size of a dove, about 200 grams. And every year, it makes a little migration from Alaska to Hawaii and then back and that's about an 88-hour flight for this little bird. But he only has 70 hours worth of fuel because he burns up about one gram of fat per hour, and he has about 70 grams. But he has to go completely over water, so there's no land. He can't land, but he doesn't swim. So once he leaves Alaska and the adults leave before the young ones leave, He's got to fly, or she, for 88 hours and can't stop. That's like three days and four nights. No sleep, no time to eat, no time to drink, but it makes it. And it can't deviate. I mean, if it is just one degree off on a 4,400-mile flight, it's out in the ocean somewhere. Now, how does it get there with only 70 hours of fuel, but it has 88-hour flight up? Well, it flies in formation, and they take turns leading. That's the way they conserve energy. When they get there, they have about six hours of fuel left. So I think God did that so that if they ran into a headwind, they could have a little extra energy there. But the adults leave, and then the baby birds, they fly later. Well, they've never been there, and yet they fly from Alaska to right where their parents are in Hawaii without anybody leading them or guiding them, and it's 100% over water. So they're flying 4,000 miles in 88 hours with no rest. And the scientists aren't even sure exactly how they do that. Endurance is one thing, but direction and navigation are just as important. Doctor, I can't imagine getting on a jet for a 4,000-mile journey if I knew that the pilot had never been there before, he didn't have a navigator, and had no communication equipment. But the Golden Plover makes that journey look easy using its astounding navigation abilities. Let's say here we have Junior, and he's flying along after the parents had gone. He's never been there before, and yet he makes it every time. Now, what would happen if he was even one degree off or one percentage point off on his navigation? Well, he's going to miss it, and yet they never miss. It's an absolute miracle that they can do that. They are precise navigational instruments wrapped up in a little bird. The Golden Plover, one of the incredible creatures that defy evolution. In just a moment, we'll return to talk with Dr. Job Martin about the largest creatures to ever inhabit our planet. These beasts can be as long as 100 feet and weigh 300,000 pounds. And it may surprise you to learn this creature is alive today. That's just ahead on Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Hi, I'm Jim Valdheis, and in a few moments, we'll get back to our discussion with Dr. Job Martin. Right now, we wanted to give you a glimpse of what you can expect in the second video in the series, Incredible Creatures That Defy Evolution. Here's an extremely condensed clip from the video that shows why some of the most intriguing creatures on the planet are whales. Here is Dr. Job Martin. It's the biggest animal that was ever created, as far as we know. We don't have any fossils of any dinosaurs that are bigger than the biggest blue whales. 100 feet long, 300,000 pounds. The tongue can weigh as much as an elephant. You might have 22 tons of blubber. I mean, we're talking tons, not pounds. Sperm whales dive, really deep dives, 550 feet a minute. Let's say it's a 70-foot whale. You get an increase of one atmosphere about every 12 feet or so. And if he's 70 feet long, he might have three or four or five different amounts of atmosphere, a pressure on different parts of its body. And you would think that might just collapse the whale. But God built the whale so that it has different amounts of pressure on its blood vessels. And it has this powerful heart, which can weigh up to a ton, pumping this blood out through all these arteries and veins and uh, they can close off certain parts of their circulatory system so that maybe they need a little more inside pressure down here if they're diving straight down. They need more pressure down here to help compensate. They can more or less direct the pressure inside their body more down here than up here. Evolution teaches that whales are really a land mammal that decided to go back into the ocean. God made whales so that when they breathe through their blowhole, they do not uh, have any connection to their mouth. Now, we have a connection. between Mammals have connections between the nose and the mouth. You can get a nose full of water and it can come down in your mouth. You can get stuff in your mouth. And as little kids, it's always coming out the nose. 
No, with a whale, what, how are they gonna eat? They're gonna have to open their mouth and sometimes under large amounts of pressure, fill up their mouth to eat so their mouth and their nose aren't hooked up. How do you have a slowly evolving something into something else where you can't have a partially unhooked up system? It's either totally unhooked up so that you can't drown or it's, it's not. And uh, so I don't see any evidence that land mammals have migrated into the ocean and become whales and porpoises and dolphins and all those kinds of things. I, I, I don't think we have any evidence for that. And I, I think it's just a testimony of the power of God to make these huge animals. And we're continuing our fascinating discussion with Dr. Joe Martin about incredible creatures. We've been talking about a lot of different creatures that defy evolution, but what about us? The evolutionary theory points to primates as our ancestors through natural selection and survival of the fittest. What do you say, Dr. Martin? As humans, do we have any special traits that point to a creator? Well, you think about that. Just the ear. The eardrum is what transmits the sounds into our inner ear and the movement that the eardrum makes. Some have described it as one one hundredth the size of a hydrogen molecule. Well, that's about the smallest molecule, so you can't even measure it. And yet, with that immeasurable little teeny bit of motion, that eardrum transmits the sounds that our brain can tell us, that is a trumpet, that is my mother, that is my dog. It's translated into an electrical impulse, and then our brain tells us, okay, that's what you're hearing. What an incredible thing that is. You just think of your hands. What can you do with your hands? God had thought about that opposable thumb and how, as humans, we need to have that opposable thumb for the many things that we do. Every single part of our body was carefully thought out. People say, you know, these primates evolved into people. Well, then you'd have to say, okay, then would it be a beneficial mutation in a primate to have their thumb on their foot? Their big toe looks like a thumb. You go to the zoo, look at the primates. They have a foot that can grab branches. They have an opposable thumb as a big toe. All right, they're going to evolve into people. They're going to have to get that big toe to evolve all the way up the side and then out the front like people's toes do. Well, is that a beneficial mutation? Let's say they get a 45 degree angle toe. They're halfway to becoming people on their feet. Well, that's not a beneficial mutation. In other words, now they can't climb trees as well. Now they can't run as well as if all the toes came out the front. So natural selection, survival of the fittest, they're out of there. So anything that would try to evolve out of what it was is going to be less apt to be able to live than the way it was before. So I think survival of the fittest really fits the creation model. As a former evolutionist, you confess it took a while for you to come to that conclusion as you struggled with the evidence that points to an intelligent creator. I'm sure after hearing about these incredible creatures that defy evolution, some of our listeners are reevaluating their own beliefs. But that may raise new questions about dinosaurs, Noah's Ark, and whether we can really trust the Bible. Dr. Martin, you've traveled across the country to speak at schools and universities. You've had to deal with these questions head on, haven't you? Well, yes. Matter of fact, I've been talking about these little animals now for over 25 years. And I have had some young couple come up with little kids and they'll come up, Dr. Martin, when I was in first grade, you came and talked about the giraffe or the bombardier beetle or the woodpecker. And that carried me all the way through college. When my professors began to convince me maybe evolution was true, God would remind me, yeah, but don't forget about that giraffe. There's no way that could evolve. I think that's one of the reasons the videos have become so popular and talking about these animals has become so popular is because most of the things we talk about or many of the things you don't ever hear in college, in, in high school, even in grade school. The average Sunday school, the average church, what are we teaching them? Well, we're teaching them the fish story of Jonah and we're teaching them this little ark story and it's not a story. You know, students will come up to me and they'll say, uh, well, Dr. Martin, there's no way dinosaurs could fit on Noah's ark. And I say, well, really, how do you know that? Well, they're, they're so big and the ark is so small. And I say, well, how big was the ark? Well, I don't know. Well, how many animals would he have to take on the ark? Well, I don't know. The ark is described with its size in the scripture. It's huge. Uh, we saw a model of the ark in Indianapolis here a couple years ago, and it was eight feet long and it was about two feet high. Then he had made scale model, according to the size of the ark, scale model people, megalosaur, dinosaurs, the biggest things he could think of. The biggest dinosaur was about the size of your thumb up against an ark that was eight feet long and about two feet high. So you could have put herds of dinosaurs in that ark with no problem at all. 
yeah, that's not a problem. Well, tell me, Dr. Martin, then what's the primary benefit that the information in the video has for our children? Well, the primary benefit, I think, is to teach young people about our God and what a great and awesome God we have that he made us. He made us in his image. He made the creation for us to enjoy. It screams of his attributes, and it's saying there is a God. There is a creator. Look, there's a creation out there. Somebody created it. And so we should be able to look at these things and say, I want to know that God that made all this. So what I hope these videos do is cause people to make them think, you know something, I really can believe the Bible. Those early chapters of Genesis, I can believe them just like they say. That should drive us into the Bible, where we get to learn about the Lord Jesus. Well, Dr. Martin, this has been a fascinating discussion. I don't think after watching these videos, I'll ever look at an animal, or myself for that matter, the same way again. Thanks for being with us. Let's do it again sometime soon. Thank you very much. I hope we can. Hey, everyone. Steve here again. If you want to learn more about not only the incredible creatures that defy evolution series, but the other films that exploration films have produced in this genre, like the master designer, the song, incredible creatures that define design, evolution's Achilles heels, and more. Go to explorationfilms.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. That's a wrap. You've been listening to the Exploration Films podcast. Explorationfilms.com.